So my name's John Conti, and I, uh, I'm here to talk to you today about uh, a library, not a new library, but people haven't heard about it very much. It's called RxJava. And um, well, we'll go through it a little bit more, but uh, Rx stands for Reactive Extensions. And I don't know about you, but that, that doesn't help me understand a thing. So uh, most people refer to it as Rx, and I'm going to spend some time explaining what that is. So my talk is going to talk about uh, what reactive programming, you know, it's a buzzword, so I think we need to kind of dispel the buzz and get down to, the, to a definition. And then there are, are a couple uh, topics that I'm going to do with code. I, one thing I learned in the last presentation is apparently live coding for presentations is not recommended, which is too bad because this is going to be code. Um, we'll see how it goes, right? I'll prove them wrong. So uh, first of all, why reactive and what is reactive? I think if you look at a chat bot, it's the simple example we all know of what reactive means, which is software that, that, that takes input and gives output as soon as the output or input is available. In other words, there's, there's very little batch orientation. There's not a go button, there's nothing. The, th the thing is alive and it's active in a very real time sense of the word. And I think that's what most people mean by reactive. Of course, as programmers, that's not a great definition. And so these are some definitions that often come up uh, around reactive, which is asynchronous, um, event driven, and non-blocking. And um, these are problematic words from a, from a code perspective. Um, asynchronous is definitely the way the world works. It's the way computers work. It's the way everything works. But most of our programming abstractions are designed to make the, the world synchronous. And they do this through blocking or waiting for I.O. to happen. Underneath the covers, it's all async and event driven. But we've spent a lot of time in software protecting ourselves from that. Um, and there, there are consequences to that, and some of our systems show it. So why would we want to do this? Well, for, for one thing, uh, reactive systems are capable of being responsive, right? Just like the chat bot, you give it input, it's immediately doing something. And what responsive allows you to do is to build some other things that we like on top of responsive, like resilient. So uh, resilient is definitely the ability of software to react to the environment. Um, and, and words like elastic and fault tolerant, these are all aspects of responsiveness. So when you look at things like robotics, human interaction systems, all these kinds of things, you, you think, oh yeah, of course, you know, it needs to be reactive. Most people don't think of server software as needing to be reactive. But in fact, if you want to scale up and down to load, and you want to handle bad data gracefully, and you want to um, suffer machine failures without your customers knowing, these are the characteristics you're really looking for. But again, as programmers, uh, coding async is not actually fun. So I've spent a lot of time doing it myself in the embedded world. Lots of people do it in the browser world. And what you end up with is some complicated messes to sort out. And the normal tools that we would rely on in our synchronous world, like stack traces, they're not helpful. So one ends up having to spend a lot of time figuring out how to debug a system, how to reason about a system, how to assemble a system and what stuff to get to help. You know, do I need promises? Do I need futures? Do I need state machines? This, that, and the other thing. And the, the real rub comes in when, when you figure that stuff out and you start doing applications, there's a really uncomfortable point at which domain level logic starts twisting together with async characteristics. And that's when life gets rough. Because what ends up happening is a very hard to test set of code. And because the domain is twisted with it, it's very likely to have to change in the future, which means that pain keeps happening over and over again as you refactor. 
So in a nutshell, RX is an async toolbox. And um, some of the tools are not particularly intuitive, but what's nice is they work together and they're learnable in a way in which after a while, it's pretty easy to figure out uh, a common set of tools that you can go grab and tame problems that give other systems that, that don't have such an abstraction a lot of trouble. In particular, what RX shines at is making that twisting of the domain and the async system code together not a problem anymore because RX code tends to make sense. In, in other words, it looks very much like a synchronous world, but it doesn't try to hide the fact that it's asynchronous. You can reason about the asynchrony and the synchronous nature of the code in the same code base with the domain level problems and not get uh, twisted and turned around. It also happens to be quite testable. So Rx then, stepping back to the very beginning to get a definition, is a specification called Reactive Extensions and a bunch of libraries for different languages. So uh, reactive extensions have been very popular on .NET, in the Java world, and in JavaScript, but lots of languages have good Rx implementations. So um, I am going to show Rx Java. The problem with Rx Java is the examples are too big, and they're tough to run in the shell, and they're, and they're tough to show interactively. So I'm going to show these examples in closure. I've spent some time trying to make this work well for someone who knows nothing about Clojure. I contemplated doing it in Groovy or JavaScript. Any of those would work, but I want to be able to show these examples live because often Rx looks harder than it is. I think if we can do some code, uh, we can make it look easy. So Rx Java 2 is one of the many reactive extension libraries. It's mature, active, sponsored, uh, Netflix is probably the biggest user on the server side, but the Android community has been getting a lot of use out of it to tame kind of the callback trouble associated with um, programming on mobile devices. So getting to our next section, um, here are a couple words that uh, are, are commonplace in Rx, observables and operators. So um, I'm going to spend some time introducing these primitives. And to do that, I need to teach you a little closure. So if you, if you look at Java and you wanted to get a string representation of an integer, you know you might have code that looks a little bit like this, you know, integer to string 42. Well, uh, Clojure does that just fine too. Um, and in fact, it's calling the Java class exactly the way that other code did. And if you see to the right of the red cursor, it's delivered a string out called, you know, 42. It's 42. Um, so closure maps directly to Java, and that is a, a wonderful thing. It's a, it's a, it makes closure a nice shell. Of course, there's an implementation of JavaScript for the JVM and Groovy. So I, I would say, you know, uh, any dynamic language mixed with Java is a, is a great combination. If you saw the previous talk, you know, I probably don't need to convince you anymore. Um, Clojure also has polymorphic functions that are shorter and sweeter. I can still get 42 by just calling str string. So you'll notice the parentheses go in a strange place. That's pretty much a lot of the difference between Java and Clojure, at least at the level we're going to do. So Clojure has iterables, just like Java does, and um, they're not much more complicated than Java ones. In fact, they're simpler to use. So here's a function call um, that increments a number. So if we increment two, we get three. That's not very controversial. We also can have functions that return collections. Here's range of five, so zero through five exclusive. And then we can do the things that we like to do with streams and iterables. We can apply functions to all the values within a collection. And this is what that looks like in Clojure. Here I'm mapping the increment function over five numbers. So now I have one through five instead of zero through four. Um, that's uh, 
possible to do other functions like filter out the odd numbers from a larger range. Again, if you've used iterable Guava collections, Java collections, this is, this is not controversial. It's a different syntax for sure. And that's a lovely preparation for what Rx achieves. Because if you want to know what an Rx observable is, it is an async iterable. So we can do the same things that we do with collections with observables. Uh, so let, let's, let's just step through that right here real quick. So we just did this one. You know, we incremented over a set of numbers. Now I'm going to need some helper functions to get from the async world back to the synchronous world so that we can print and see our <coughs> results. So I've written a little function here. I'm calling it gather. And um, basically all it does is take a observable stream, and we'll get into more about the definition of what that is, that async iterable, and it turns it back into a collection so I can print it. Um, the other thing I need to do is I need to kind of be able to make a stream from a collection. And note the code here, it says rx slash from call. That rx slash is a namespace enclosure. So I'm I'm essentially calling from an Rx library. So if we put all that together, right, I can take my range from 0 to 10, I can turn it into an observable stream, and then I can do the equivalent operation over the stream. I can map the increment function over the entire stream and then turn it back into a collection. So effectively, I'm accomplishing the same thing albeit in a more complicated way. And so we're going to build on this you know, very simple model here. So the big difference is I said, I said async iterable. That, I mean, you probably had a question mark over your head saying, what is an async iterable? Well, let me give you an example of what that might mean. I'm going to define a little, little function here, and it invokes an Rx prim primitive called interval. And, um, and you'll also notice me using another function here, take. So take the first five values from this interval. OK. So um, that's, you know, let's uh, dispel uh, that anything special is happening here. This looks like counting up to four again. Right, so there's nothing, it's kind of weird, what's that 10 doing there? Um, and if I take two of these and I apply a, uh, an operator called concat, you know, for concatenate, one gets kind of the obvious result, right? You get zero to four twice put together. That's, you know, that's not very, very interesting. But if I use a different operator, merge, all of a sudden the numbers are scrambled. And that's because interval takes a millisecond delay between the values that it creates as an argument. So what concat does is it puts together two sequences no matter what the time of the arrival of those values are. But merge does something totally different. It puts together two streams and it takes values on a first come first serve basis. So you'll notice on the left side of the sequence, they both start with zero. But as the numbers go to the right, they get more jumbled as the 15 millisecond observable starts to fall behind. So one of the ways that we visualize this behavior, because you notice here that concat sort of obeyed a synchronous looking contract and merge just threw it out the window. And so uh, folks who do Rx a fair amount, uh, I did not start my timer. Hmm. That's not useful. Um, use things called bubble diagrams. And uh, bubble diagrams help visualize the behavior. The way this works is time is going from left to right. The inputs are on top. The outputs are on the bottom. In this particular case, Concat has two different streams that are an input. You'll notice the vertical line on the first stream ends the first stream, and at that point, the second stream picks up. 
If you look at merge, it's a different diagram. What am I doing on time? Uh, 15 maybe? 20? Thank you. Okay, right. Nice, thank you. Get that back. Okay, so you'll notice merge takes values on a first come, first serve basis. Uh, you'll also notice an X on the top one. That actually shows what an error looks like, meaning if, it, if an error happens, then uh, the first stream ends, and the second stream will never output a value after the first stream errors. So you notice these documents, these drawings, can visualize a lot of behavior, both logical and um, time-based. So the magic then, just like collections, just like iterables, is in composing these things. So we have these time-based iterables, and we can compose them with operators, and that's really the secret sauce. So uh, before we go too much further, I want to uh, introduce, you know, the, the notion of an operator is that if we have uh, a definition which is this range up to 10 is this collection of 0 to 9, we can uh, invoke our from collection thing to get this observable call I'm calling 10 obs. Now you notice when I look at that value uh, you get this Java object. You get this instantiation of a Java class. And that's what's, what's happened here is that we no longer have a collection. We have an observable hooked up to a collection. And these are the kinds of classes that are hidden underneath the facade of the Java Rx library. So now I can make a new observable by composing on top of that 10 observable this rx map operator. So you see map here is an operator, 10 obs is the observable. So the observable is behaving like the collection and um, the operator is behaving uh, sort of like um, the iterator. So I can make a new one and you'll notice uh, my increment observable is just, you know, a new flavor of observable. It's just a new class. But essentially, it now wraps up behavior as well as this data. So now if I go ahead and I turn that back to the synchronous world, I have once again found a new way to increment uh, a, a set of numbers. So, but that's the basic thing that's going on here, and I, I want people to realize that it's super simple. It looks like the builder pattern, it looks like iterators, it looks like, and that's the whole thing, is that we're going to write code in a form in which we're used to writing every day. Now, those operators are a little weird, right? They operate in the time domain, but the methods that we're using to assemble these things, that's just old hat. So observables compose just like iterables. So let's run a filter. So here I'm saying take six out of the 10 numbers, mod them by two and see if they're zero. Okay, I found out how to, how to get even numbers. Um, and I did that with functions, plain old functions and, and, and closure iterables. You know, the, the code in Rx, I, I, you know, I'm, I'm sure if you don't code closure, these parentheses and indenting are certainly annoying, but it's not rocket science to figure out what's going on here. So uh, the way this, this works, what's in that Rx specification is called the observable contract. And the first part of the contract is what's allowing us to do this, is that observables um, are sequentially synchronized although they will concurrently execute. In other words, when we went to the merge operator, it wasn't clear which input would be chosen, but it was clear that there was a stream of output that was in fact ordered. And once that is ordered, once that output happens, that output will not change order. It is sequentially ordered on the way out. Okay, so we're gonna do a little more closure. Um, each of these four pieces of code are identical. And so sometimes closureists, because we only have data to program with, we sort of have like 
no syntax. We have to get creative. And, and I want you to see you know, some, some better examples, and, and so I, I think I should go through this. Here's you know, how we might do it normally. We might create those variables, and then we might, uh, you know, those temporary values that we want, and then run them. That, yeah, that's kind of neat. Or we might do what we did uh, on the previous slide, which was, you know, um, nest everything. Uh, a closureist is more likely to do something like this third one. This is called threading. And what happens is you take the value from the first form, the one on the top, and then you put it into the, the, the position at the end of this next form. And then you take the output of that one and you put it to this form. And this allows us to essentially not nest, not have temporary values, and put code top to bottom. And so I end up with something exactly like that, and I'm reading code top to bottom. And again, this is because we're stuck with so many parentheses, we invent clever ways like this to put code on top of each other. But hey, you know, it's for the humans. Um, but that can be abused. As you notice, the horizontal form doesn't look so nice, but, but we'll abuse it. We will. Everyone does. Okay, so I'm going to introduce some more complicated operators. Here's one called zip. And my best description of zip is that it weaves. It takes two input observables and some sort of function of the two of them and composes these values together. Now you'll notice it waits for a value on one observable, waits for a value on the next, then it runs its function, and then it goes back and gets a new value. It will not get two values from the first observable. It wants a value from that second observable before it's going to go on. So that's why I call it kind of weaving. Uh, so here's some code uh, to make rainbows, right? Because, you know, this is all about Kool-Aid, unicorns, rainbows. So we're going to make some rainbows. So it turns out I learned from this link how to make a rainbow because it turns out it's harder than it looks. You need three colors and you need them phase shifted. So if you regarded each color as being 0 to 359 degrees, then you need R, G, and B such that if R is at phase zero, G is 120 degrees further shifted to the right. And uh, R, G, B is 240 degrees. So what I've done here is I created uh, um, an observable that basically takes the phase shift and a timer, and they're all running on the same timer. You notice I create up here a timer. And then I feed that timer to each of these guys. And I say, I want you to output colors every time the timer ticks, and I want them shifted by this phase shift. So I created this little observable. And in fact, um, what I can do here is I can show a little output. I can say, gather. What is that they say about live coding? Don't do this. Don't try this at home. Don't try this at home. Next, 10. And of course, I don't actually have that timer. So I need to get it. So I need a timer. OK, so uh -oh. see, of course. Ah, uh ha -huh. ha. See, I guess this is why they say don't code live. Could it be? Could it be? I think that's probably why they do. Okay. Here we go. Make sure. Oh. Okay. Got it. I didn't read it well the last time. We'll, we'll get it this time. I, I'm, I'm pretty sure. Right? Right? This live coding thing, I can do it. I can do it. I can do it. OK. We'll say uh, 40, because that's the right value. OK. All right. So now we got a timer, and I can show you some values from one of those. <laughs> ah. 
guess they're right about this life coding thing. I guess they're right about that. Okay, so here I'm basically just producing values. Now this is one of the ways in which observables become testable. In the same way that collections look very much like functions, so do observables. In other words, if you convert from the synchronous world into the asynchronous world, run operations through a set of operators or an observable and convert back to the synchronous world, you have a very testable piece of code. It looks like a pure function. It's nothing like a pure function under the hood, but it's super testable. You haven't had to mock anything out. You can make fake inputs and gather outputs and, and it's all easy. So um, I have now zipped three of these together. So essentially I'm gonna get a vector because that's the default for the function of zip in this library. And I'm going to get a little vector of those three numbers, which of course I can convert to a color. And uh, if things go well, I'm just setting the background of this observable. So every 40 milliseconds, it's outputting uh, three new numbers on three different observables. And then zip is making sure that I synchronize those things together, no matter how much they jitter and they come together to make a single vector, which is a color. And then I can make rainbows. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so I have one more example, and I have to do this. It's a little overly complicated. So if you, if you look at this example and say, oh my golly, don't freak out. But the thing is, is this is output. And output isn't hard from an async perspective. It looks surprisingly like the synchronous world. It's much more likely that you're gonna be doing something with input async input, and that's where life is going to hurt. So uh, the, the last part of the observable contract is that streams of values may complete. I think I mentioned that. An error is a completion, and a completed stream will never again produce a value. So uh, when we put all of this together, um, we can do some interesting stuff. So I've built here uh, an observable that goes out and searches Hacker News. And so I decided that what I wanted to do was figure out, well, what's the buzz on Rx? So I, I, I have some terms here, Rx Java, Rx Android, Rx, and Rx JS. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to go out and search for those things. And I'm going to total the points, the Hacker News you know, score, for each hit I get and plot that from like, I think it's uh, maybe 2010 or, or 2000. So what you'll notice here is, is that I'm, I'm, I'm flat mapping. And what flat mapping is, is it looks exactly like map, except for the return type is another observable. So instead of just saying I'm mapping to a value, I'm mapping to observable sequences, which you need to concatenate together to make a, an output. And um, reduce is very similar to the reduce you would do on collections. I take a sequence of values, I apply a function that's constantly accumulating a result. And I admit, you know, this is a lot of code. Um, but the point is, is I'm gonna make tens of calls, if the demo gods favor me, <laughs> tens of calls <laughs> to Hacker News search, and uh, we'll, we'll get a pretty picture. So, sacrifice to the gods now, supposedly. Yes, the gods have favored us. Okay. Um, and so, uh, what happened here was I took a bunch of input, uh, all running asynchronously on a thread pool, but it looked in the code like all I was doing was reducing a collection. And you can see here, uh, a, you know, that different Rx libraries obtain favorite at different times. You can see Rx Java has had recent releases so that it's got a bump. You can see Rx Android is sort of like not there. I've also noticed these results change quite a bit. But you'll notice the overall trend over time is that Rx has been used more and more. And in fact, that's my experience too, is that once someone adopts Rx for doing asynchronous I.O., it's very hard to put it down because a lot of terrible code becomes really great code. And um, that's sort of valuable. So in summary, um, the RxUpside is flexible concurrent application logic. 
Uh, some of the stuff I didn't tell you about is that the error handling story is super great here. And that's how we get away from that stack trace awfulness. Um, in RxJava, the integration with threads, the ability to create a thread pool and to schedule Rx uh, operators onto thread pools is simple and easy. Now, and there's a large ecosystem of available libraries. Now, of course, there's lots of things Rx can't fix. <laughs> uh, stack traces are as bad as ever. If you get a stack trace from Rx, it looks just as awful as everything else. And once people get excited about Rx, they're going to do what I think all of us have done uh, when we learn Rx is we Rx everything and code ourselves into a whole bunch of trouble. Um, you know, async is not the way to go if a synchronous piece of code will work. If synchronous is is fine and it works for the domain, don't leave synchronous behind. But if you want to process collections that are bigger than the memory footprint that you, that you have, if you want to stream data, if you want to do incremental updates on the fly, if you want to code responsive systems, Rx will be your friend. Um, here are some of those libraries. There's about 80 out there. Um, so JDBC integration, HTTP integration, you know, things like Redis and stuff like that. Uh, lots of stuff out there. Thank you. Yeah, that's it. Questions, anyone? This is what happens at the end of the day. <laughs> yeah. Um, the question was, am I using Rx at Clearwater? I am using Rx at Clearwater server side. Um, and anyone who's using Angular 2 is using them client side in the browser. Rx.js is an integral part of Angular 2, Angular 4. Um, and, and lots of other little applications. I would say that server side, it's not being used very much. Maybe I'm one of the only ones. Um, client side, I would say, RxJS has, has experienced a lot of popularity and is in use uh, for lots of different, different use cases on the client. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, so the question was, why, why is the server less popular? Um, so I can, I can guess. Netflix introduced the server side in about uh, 2005, I think. And then they did like one talk and walked away. Uh, they were too busy programming, apparently. Um, when uh, Angular and uh, some of the other frameworks started to pick up RxJS, it really started to beat the drum of it. So on the server side, people didn't discover Rx unless they had a pressing need to do so. So if they were doing event-driven systems, they would find Rx because they were deep into trouble. Um, client side, they picked it up every day because it's inherently asynchronous, <laughs> and they were in trouble from day one. Yeah. So. Any other questions? Again, thanks for coming at the end of the day. I really appreciate it. Hope you have a good day. Yeah, thanks. <laughs>